Hello, hello, dear hearts. Marilyn here with another segment of Wisdom's Way of Learning. Today we are beginning to go through the book, The Unit of Life Learning Model. This is book two of Wisdom's Way of Learning. This is what it looks like. And we are going to be discussing how you can nurture complete learning process in your children and develop the language learning tools at the same time. And so we're talking about informal learning today. And there are many formal aspects to informal learning. It just looks differently than strict formal learning looks like. I'm going to show you a chart here. Um, this is from the book SATs, the Science, Art, and Tools of Learning. So we're in the thread down here. I had introduced to you the the language learning tools of of each of the stages of the framework. And now we're down in the informal learning model. Later we'll go into the uh, formal learning model. And so this informal learning model goes through all four stages of the framework and it will um, show you on the chart what it, what, um, usually is addressed in those stages. Now in this book, there are six chapters and today we're just going to go through two. Um, what I'm wanting to show you about the informal learning model, unit of life informal learning model. So this is the big picture of the the informal learning model we're going to be discussing all four of these activities of learning they're just regular everyday type activities of learning uh, reading collecting a uh, notebook recording and related projects then next week we're going to go deeper into notebook recording and i'm going to give you six uh, applications of notebook records and discuss the notebook methodology and the notebook nuts and bolts. But today we're laying the foundation of the principles, the undergirding principles of this learning model and um, how it's a goal setting model for children and adolescents and how it gives direction to the informal learning activities I just showed you of reading, collecting, recording, and projects, constructing projects. And then we're going to go into, um, so this week, that's what we're going to go into, those four activities, and then we'll delve deeper into the recording notebook methodology next week. And so it goes from, um, more of a big picture to a small picture as we go through this book. And so next week there'll be way more practical examples, but there are some this week as well that I'll be sharing with you. And there are five, three, three charts. One I just showed you, one that's contrasting the unit method with the unit of life a learning model and one that's contrasting notebook methodology with workbook methodology. And that we'll be covering next week. And then also next week, um, little piece here about character qualities of notebook work for your children. And a love of learning doesn't begin at a desk, but with child's play. This is where this book, uh, Unit of Life Learning Model, this is where it gets really practical. And from Notebook Nuts and Bolts, I think I'll actually go into sharing with you more in depth um, the bird book project so that you can just keep, we'll just keep going deeper and deeper so that you can see how I implemented uh, notebook methodology in my family and um, and next week you're going to learn about six applications of notebook recording and you can see that on this chart as well um, there are uh, skill work 
booklet building, records of collections, records of projects, records of written work, and unit of life book projects, which is like Catherine's bird book. So now I just made all of this up. Honestly, it's I what I did was Wisdom's way of learning is I I delved in to uncover what works in real life. What are the principles that work in real life? What kinds of tools can you use that will work in real life without having to use an artificially contrived um, learning activity or an artificially contrived and written curriculum? And that's what this is about. And so the unit of life learning model is a goal setting model that will help you to um, bring order to a natural, naturally unfolding learning process, you see? Um, and so the first thing that I would like to do is describe what the learning model is not. It's uh, because it's not, um, I don't want you thinking through the lens of curriculum uh, program. It's not something you can pick up and, oh, I'm going to do this and then read the instructions and go through the assignments. It's not like that at all. I want you to dispense with that kind of idea because it's a waste of your time and your children's time. But first, the unit of life learning model, it encompasses an entire lifestyle of years of bringing to a visible, tangible product the results of years of collecting knowledge of a favorite topic of interest. And so I'll use um, this example. And of course, as we're going through the notebooks next week, you will see that they can lead up to a larger project um, similar to Catherine's bird book. This is uh, Catherine's bird book. This is a pet peacock that we actually did have. <laughs> We had uh, 28 peacocks at one time. And so this is loaded and it is over 100 pages. I think it's close to 120 pages now because she added so many stories to it. But um, uh, it has title pages and it has stories and, and uh, many birds and feather, a feather collection. And so if you can see, I'm just gonna show you a little bit here. Those are real feathers. Um, this is too awkward to lift up to show you, but I wanted, I want you to see how big the book is. I have a smaller um, display that's much easier to work with. Um, that I used on my display tables at the Lifestyle of Learning um, conferences that we held. It was a page of, of peacock feathers. Of course, these are color copies. They're not actually the original feathers. The feathers are in the, the original bird book that I just got through showing you. And so I just wanted you to see the scope of this. Um, I, I've shown this a few times throughout this Wisdom's Way of Learning series so that um, you could see up close a little bit better what this project was about. Um, anyway, so what I'm... This is a unit of life book project. And my daughter spent years collecting feathers informally. Um, you know that already. She, she spent years informally collecting feathers and knowledge about birds, you know, making bird feeders and and um, drawing pictures of birds and looking them up in identification books and all of that. And so when it was time to demonstrate the knowledge of, of that learning process, that one piece, she had many themes and interests but that one piece I looked at it, I thought oh that could go in a notebook because they're flat feathers are flat and so that's what I chose I chose the bird 
book. And then she collected up everything she had, photos, feathers, and everything. And we sorted, and she started telling me all the contents that she had. And we made a contents list. And from there, we knew what she was going to be doing in the construction of this bird book, you see. And that bird book actually was culminated a season of her interest in birds. She had many, many real life stories of experiences with birds that she had been writing already. And so she continued writing them, collecting them up, and they ended up going into the bird book with the feathers and the drawings she made and the additional uh, raw material that she collected by research about the birds and what part of the body the feathers came from, whether it was male or female. She had all the details written out on each page where a new bird was featured in the book, you see. And so this project encompassed an entire lifestyle of many years bringing to a visible, tangible product the results of years of collecting knowledge on a favorite topic of interest. Now she did a similar thing with horses. She made another book just on horses because she drew horses a lot, but she did a lot of research. Now her horse book is a normal size notebook, you know, like those inch thick ones. And this is the, the sample um, copy of it that we have uh, we had on our lifestyle learning tables. Uh, she drew this with colored pencils. But she did lots of research on horses here. She did um, the confirmation of horses, the types of horses. Um, let me see. The parts of the horse. Um, the different... Uh, ways the legs and head and hooves and and feet look and she drew all these diagrams you see so it wasn't just drawings of pretty drawings of horses she did a lot of study and wanted and had been doing this for years reading horse magazines and books and she just loved horse she eventually did have a her own horse, and that's her drawing. And another one of, of the horse running. And so she was 15, just turned 15 when she made this book. And some of these drawings are older than others, you know, because they, she didn't just make them all just for this book. She had had them, some of them. And then she did a Western saddle. Uh, okay, that's kind of hard to see, but I just wanted you to have an idea. Pets, my kids wanted to have. Uh, just an idea. And a dream horse, you know. So there's, um, they had, um, in long-term interests. And so you need to see how the difference between the notebook methodology and unit of life book project, it is totally different. You can't just take, oh, I'm gonna get a curriculum on horses and plop my kid in front of it. You see, that's not what it's about. You're wanting your children to learn how to communicate what they know already. And it doesn't matter how sophisticated or unsophisticated it is. But by the time they're 14, 15, they're beginning to do more sophisticated work, you see? Um, and in the meantime, you have six categories of note or applications of notebook records that prepare them for that, you see? And that's what I was just describing to you in different applications. You've got the skill work, the booklet building when they're really little, the records of collections when they're young, records of, of, of projects they're working on, records of written work. So it's not all about one topic. They're all different types of activities and different topics that you have your kids doing 
they're doing real life things all throughout childhood, you see? So the notebooks increase in their level of difficulty throughout childhood and honestly reflect the current ability and interests of each child. You're not taking a curriculum and expecting them to copy the model of whatever um, project that you have the ability to do, you see? And that's something that I had done with the unit method. I had made this big book with a history of communication. And I had Catherine just copy it. How ridiculous that was. And she was, um, let me see, probably 12, 13 at that time when we went through that project. And she was 14 when she did the birth book all by herself. She had the capacity to do so much more and prove it, prove that it was her work. And instead, I wasted five months of her life having her do my work, copying my work, you see? It's just a waste of time. She doesn't have anything to show for that. She has a book, but I'm the one that created the book. She just copied it. It was like when she used to copy coloring books when she was six years old. She would trace and then um, staple pages together, duplicating the coloring book. You see, that wasn't her work. She was learning through it because she was teaching herself how to draw. After she copied, she would she would trace and then she would copy. She would trace and then she would copy. And so her drawing just kept improving over and over. Those first six years from the age of six to 12, that's how she taught herself copying the model. Well, with the... Um, 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 all the years of her making booklets and books, watching how mommy does books because we we had a book publishing business in our home. And so our kids grew up learning how to make books. That was the only way she needed to copy me. She didn't need to go through a five month curriculum on the history of communication in order to learn how to make a book, you see. There's many other simpler books just stapled together, little, you know, pieces of paper. You know, my numbers book. It's just a little, my grandkids do the very same thing. They make little books and staple pages together. We used to um, carry a set of these. And this is in a plastic bag, but there's one, two, three, four different sizes here of booklets um, and it's just blank paper on the inside and I used them for my kids and we carried them so that it'd be easy for moms to have a we didn't have a whole bunch of them in a pack so they could use them for their kids to make booklets and my grandkids use these all the time. I have not very many left because they've gone through them quite a bit. But they love making books. All right, so where was I? So um, the notebooks increase in, in their level of difficulty throughout childhood. Um, the third reason to do a unit of life and that why it's different it's um, It provides a wrap-up season for an older student ages 14 to 18 to communicate in a substantial way a field of knowledge that he's practiced and mastered to his current level of ability, like the bird book or the horse book. So the primary purpose of the unit of life learning model is to help you to help your children discover their God-ordained life purpose while they are young. Did birds become my daughter's life purpose? Of course not. <laughs> of course not. You see, it's a study model. When, when you teach your kids how to learn, they go from one subject of interest, they increase to different, they expand out into different subjects of interest, and they know how to learn those subjects of interest. You see, they continue to explore and expand and deepen their current abilities to learn. You see, because once that informal learning pro pro season was finished, when Catherine was 15, she went on into formal applications of the learning tools. 
so did John. They both went on into formal applications. And by that time, they knew how to learn really well. They knew how to learn thoroughly and completely and with great detail. They knew how to pay attention to a subject and they knew how to uncover a subject by that time, you see? And so, and that's what we're trying to do when we learn. We're uncovering some things, aren't we? So you're helping your children to discover their purpose right now and their future purpose through the learning process. And so mom, you encourage and, and you channel your children's delight directed informal learning pursuits and, and that take place all throughout the course of childhood into a wonderful, unique learning experience. My kids loved making their notebooks. They really thoroughly enjoyed making them. So the unit of life learning model is an all-encompassing life purpose, life discipling, lifestyle learning approach because you're training your children up into that. They're getting trained. They're getting discipled. They're learning how to relate with their own learning process. They're learning how to relate with the nudgings of God to their own conscience. You know, I've, I found something the other day. Let me see if I can. Yeah, because I remember John coming to me a couple of different times. Uh, while he was growing up, telling me that he felt like he was supposed to do thus and so. And and what I'm referring to about thus and so were things that were hard for him to do. Um, I found a, a page from his journal that he actually um, published in one of our lifestyle learning journal, family journals in 2003. He had been keeping a habit of daily journaling at that point, And I think he went on for three years with that. Anyway, so he wrote this about a year and a half ago. I started keeping a daily journal. Before that, I had never done much writing, just a letter to someone once in a while. And my mom would have me copy scripture verses for curse of practice. So when I began journaling, I was only writing down the main events of the day. And as I got better at writing, I started adding more depth to it. My mom has been editing my journal for me. And through that, my spelling has improved a lot. It has also improved just by looking up words in the dictionary occasionally. I learned how to type because I'm writing my journal on the computer. I once started learning how to type years ago, but my mom didn't have me continue because I didn't have a need or desire to at the time, principal ladies. <laughs> I now like typing because I have a reason to do it. Principal ladies. <laughs> I like journaling because it's fun reading about the events of our lives and it has helped me a lot to improve in the mechanics of writing. I've decided to start working on my style and improving my vocabulary this next year. Because he knows that there, he, he knew there was a mechanics of writing and a style of writing. You see that writing includes both. And he was had been working on the mechanics, and there he was, choosing on his own to begin working more on the style and vocabulary of writing. So, and then he goes on, if you have never thought about keeping a daily journal, maybe now would be a good time to start. I had never really considered journaling until my sister Catherine started reading entries from her journal to me. I hope you find, like I did, that there's a lot to learn from the habit of journaling. And so that was published in our, our Lifestyle Learning Journal back in 2003. He he was up leveling his own writing process, you see. And he did the same thing when it came to cursive because he didn't know how to do cursive at the traditional age of eight and nine. It was really hard for him to learn how to do manuscript. And so I didn't want to put him through that. But when he was 14, he came to me and he said he was ready to learn how to do cursive. And I remember when he first wanted to write his journal, start his journal, he came to me and said, I'm feeling like the Lord is telling me that I'm supposed to do more writing. And he had been inspired by Catherine's 
journal because she was reading entries to him like like he said in that little piece and so he was already had already been and Catherine had done all those things as well telling me what they felt like they're supposed to do next up leveling their um their skills and deepening their studies and expanding their interests. You see, they were generating their own education, basically. And that happened much earlier than 14, but I was still very in heavily involved in providing certain things that I wanted them to do. But by the time they were 14, I was able to let go of that because I knew they had the character to continue on their own without me having to impose requirements, you see. So now I want to describe to you the unique qualities of the unit of life learning model. So remember, the content is drawn from the child's life interests. The content, the curriculum for this learning model has to stem from a unit or part of your child's own life. That's simple, right? And this will give his work the unique quality of being truly his, his work and not mom's, not someone else's. He will be the true student, the true learner, the one actively engaged in thinking and producing and creating. And the product of this work will not only reflect him, the student who did the learning, but the product will also express in original creative ways who he is and his own personal life interests. And for this reason, mom, you'll be unable to get curriculum from someone else to duplicate for your child to do for homeschooling. You see that, right? You see that. Here's another unique quality of the unit of life learning model. An adequate season of delight directed learning is necessary to produce the content within the student. Now, if a student has only been interested in something for a year, you're going to end up with a project, a much more scaled down project which is fine you can do that but it's not a unit of life model where they can create a big project okay you actually need three plus years i think of really delving into an interest and in in my kids' cases i think it was it was more than three years for their projects. But if I had had the revelation, the inspiration um, toward that earlier on, I feel like they probably could have done them sooner. Um, 13, 12, 13, they could have probably produced a larger notebook at those ages rather than waiting until 14, 15, because that's when I actually had the inspiration for the unit of life learning model. And so um, they would have done, they did other projects, um, the smaller notebooks. For instance, John, when he was younger, he had a wild animal fur collection. And that's what this is. And so it's not large because how often do you find wild animal fur? You know, so it's not a lot. This is a mountain goat fur that he found in the mountains and uh, this one was bear black bear that we found on the trail where we were accustomed to walking regularly and it was very pungent in odor as we approached it because the bear had been in some kind of altercation with another animal this is um elk mane very rough uh hair of an elk mane and then elk body fur body fur and so it's not a lot i mean it doesn't even say at uh, the time that he did this he was only 10 and it doesn't even say where he found these because they hadn't been documented he had just collected it and so it's not on there it just says what they were and then he had made a little notebook little mammal skins and tails um which he wanted to do when Catherine was working on her bird book because he 
she was having so much fun doing it and he wanted to make something too. And this is what he could do at the age of 10. That was a metal bowl that he skinned, that he and Catherine skinned. And it gives the date and the, um, there's a garter snake in here. He has a mole skin and he has some tail, squirrel tail and um, other weasel tail and he has a bird wing and another metal bowl attached to some a piece of felt anyway and then he had another book where he did um Catherine and John's pets and so he has um all of the categories of pets um that they've had that they had over the years up until that time Dogs, cats, horses, chickens, peafowl, and little critters. Okay, and so there are pictures and the names of them and the dates uh, posted throughout. And he did all the little handwriting. And um, he did all the little the labeling of the pictures. So, so you see, you can have your kids do smaller projects. Um, you want them to do projects that are in keeping with where they're at and with a little bit of challenge. You see, you don't want you don't want to overwhelm them with a lot of work that isn't theirs. And you want it to reflect their learning process and accurate reflection, okay? But it, it requires a long term learning process and preparation for a for later higher quality product and when you are willing to postpone the higher quality product more extensive work like the bird book was um when you're willing to postpone that it will require some faith on your part mom um maybe your child can't do that at the age of 10. No, of course not. But maybe they can do something like this at the age of 10. This is what John did when he was 10, a record of projects. And they're just, uh, I made these books. And they're just photos of projects that he did and that he I had him write about. That was for his writing practice. So that he would always, I always wanted to keep writing in front of my kids, keep reading and writing in front of them so that they knew that it was part of everyday life. It was part of the lifestyle of learning. Um, so you need to allow an adequate season of delight directed learning to be have transpired in your children's lives in order for the content to be produced within them and ultimately produced through them because anybody who learns any adult who learns knows that they can't produce something that they don't know much about can you no, not without an artificial assignment generated by somebody else put into your lap right? You need to actually learn some things and, and do some studying of your own to have something to say about any kind of a subject. That's real life. So without an adequate process, um, this concept, the unit of life learning model won't work and mom will remain bound doing most of the work herself. Worse yet, you'll end up force feeding irrelevant content to your children through programs and other means to make sure their education is happening. Well, that's a false artificial um, expression of education anyway. So the unit of life learning model provides long-term purpose and direction for the many delight directed informal learning activities that occur throughout childhood and adolescence and rather than a sense of randomness that's often felt with informal learning the unit of life learning model brings unity to many seemingly unrelated learning activities such as the four learning activities that we're going to discuss next in the next chapter remember the reading collecting the notebooks and the projects they seem to be unrelated 
but together and if they're approached in a well-rounded way in this child's life together they create a model that brings unity and make sense of all of the seeming randomness of informal natural learning in everyday life. Another unique quality of this learning model is that it, it, it actually completes the informal learning process because anytime you take um, an interest that a child has randomly pursued for a few years and you collect that up and and make an effort to uh, have your children communicate what they know into some kind of a visible product you are going through all the stages of the learning process remember communication rhetoric the learning tool rhetoric communication is the final stage and so your children can go through all four stages of the learning process the preparing collecting processing and communicating stage all in one period of time um, they can go through all of that when they're 10 they can go through all of it when they're 14 they can go through all of it every time they have enough knowledge of an interest to put into some kind of a project, whether it be a, an essay or a physical product like the bird book or the horse book, you see. And so you can um, be having your children producing what they know all along the way. That's what notebook methodology is all about. Blank paper. We're going to go into notebook methodology next week. Be sure to tune in because it's very practical and notebook nuts and bolts. And I'll go through the six applications of notebook recording for you. So this model completes the informal learning process and it sends your children, your students on into deeper applications of the learning tools and expands their vision for what to do with their life. You know, they'll want to learn um, other things, other areas, subject areas of interest. They'll want to move into um, harder applications of the learning tools. They will challenge themselves to go um, deeper, harder, and more expansive with their entire learning process. And so it's a very good, um, a Unova Life Learning Model is a very good completion of that period of time in mid-adolescence before they they launch into older adolescence and adulthood into more formal applications of the learning tools. Okay. Um, communication, like on the, the lifestyle learning framework, it is a necessary final stage to any learning process for it to be truly considered complete. And if you've been following my videos through the Science, Art, and Tools of Learning, you will have already learned that. Communication in any kind of tangible form gives closure to a season of a child's areas of interest that were learned informally. And it also provides substance in the visual, visible product um, that actually reflects an accurately it reflects accurately an inward invisible ability and understanding of a subject and it serves to develop and propel student for continuous education in the learning tool so adequately expresses the child's own grasp of all five of the learning tools of research reason relate record and rhetoric Another unique quality of this approach is that it provides a serious portfolio for the older student. <laughs> oh my goodness. I remember the time when um, I, I knew somebody who loved to document lots and lots of details of all of her kids' activities, but she documented them in advance. She pre-planned everything and 
I didn't like to do that. I wanted to document what was actually happening. So I always documented after the fact because I wanted to God a real life. And you don't know what's going to really happen in real life, right? And so you can't really plan everything out. Well, uh, she was really into forms and lots of forms and things for record keeping. And I attempted to do that for Catherine. Uh, I didn't know yet if she was going to go to college. She was interested in becoming a vet. And so um, by the time she was oh, 17, we had to get serious and figure out, okay, what what do you really want to do? But in the meantime, I felt a need to experiment with documenting all of our projects and figuring out, well, what's this going to look like to um, people who only understand grades, right? I needed a portfolio, and so I wanted to document her portfolio on paper, which there's nothing wrong with that, but I didn't do it for very long because I came to realize that I didn't really need to do that. The portfolio itself served well enough. I didn't, you know, just having a, a project documented on a piece of paper, doesn't reflect the project very well. It's better just to take the actual project. And this reminds me of my daughter in love, Irene and John. When Irene had to go down to uh, customs all the time to, oh gosh, uh, go through the interview process for her, um, her visa or her to update it or to get her green card or whatever it was, she had to take um, photo albums of her real life. And she and John photographed everything anyway. They just had a huge, full, real life with our family. And so um, there was no way they could fabricate the life that they had. They could have taken you know, a piece of paper and documented uh, imaginary photo albums and said, oh, we have 300 and some photos of this. We have um, 430 photos of this year uh, of, and of this trip and of this event and of this birthday and Christmas with the family and they could have listed all of that and it could have just been made up you know what she just took a whole box of photo albums to prove to the interviewer that they had a real life a whole box I mean I'm not kidding there had been a dozen photo albums in this box for different events and years of their life together and um, and so it's a similar to the portfolio. The real portfolio is proof enough. I didn't have to go to the trouble of documenting um, all the projects. You know, oh, there's um, 28 stories and, you know, 233 feathers and blah, blah, blah. You know, um, I could do that. I, I did try to do that for a while, but it was too much work. <laughs> it's easier just to let the student do the work of their own projects. And then if you have to show the projects, show the projects. Um, another thing that um, people are really concerned about is being able to pass tests. And what I found is if you have got your kids in a wide variety of books and audio tapes over the years to learn the specific um, areas of knowledge that you want them to have, a measure of America's Christian history, a measure of world history, a measure of geography, science, if they are doing real life, they learn so much. It goes beyond what they would require on a test. They learn way more than they learn in the textbooks. And they learn it well because of the 
the level of interest that they have. And so it's not really a concern. The only real concern are their weak areas. So for instance, if math was a weak area to one of the kids, they would marathon math for the year prior to going to college. By that time, they know how to learn and they have a reason to learn it in order to go to college. You see, the same is true of if they're not science oriented kids, but they might have to have some chemistry. Well, then they would marathon that. You don't have to have all the years prior to that developing levels of math or chemistry or science. If your children are doing lots of real life and working on projects and doing lots of reading and doing lots of listening to audios with you, those kinds of activities, learning activities, and your life is rich with learning activities, you don't have anything to worry about, okay? So another unique quality of this approach is it develops all five of the learning tools. It's creative, fun, it sharpens all the language skills in preparation for future studies, and it uses the notebook methodology, which we will be explaining more next week in the next video. Another unique quality is it trains your children in good stewardship. Um, exercising a habit of good stewardship over what they have been learning, over any kind of random approach they've had to a piece of their learning process, some area of interest. You can teach them to um, 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 become more focused with a piece of their life um, and steward it uh, with more detail and more focus and uh, giving them a little bit more purpose in their learning process. And also it helps to generate for their vision. So when children can produce something of significance to communicate the knowledge that they spend time collecting and accumulating during their own learning process, they actually have something to offer. They have something to contribute to other people. So rather than writing a book for publication, the child can make a book project containing many different mediums of expression, like the uh, bird book uh, contained um, photos, drawings, feathers, the raw material, and stories. So, and, and it had all of that, um, lots of mediums of expression in one project. So childhood is the time to prepare your children with solid learning and stewardship habits and that collectively will lead to further pur purpose. So remember that the unit of life learning model differs from the typical unit method. The major difference between them is that the unit method is learning a content that you do for a season on purpose just to collect knowledge that is still unknown, but in a brief span of time, you know, so that maybe you can pass a test or whatever. Whereas a unit of life encompasses a lifestyle of learning of a few, few to several years. And this contrast is really sharp. With the unit method, the goal is to gain content, whereas a unit of life will provide a means with which to communicate the content already internalized by the student. And it will also serve to develop the use of learning tools, deepen the discipline of study habits, as well as deepen the knowledge of the subject. Usually with the unit method, the topic is predetermined by some form of curriculum or guide or teacher. And it can also be pursued from scratch by finding your own material. But mom usually conducts the study for her children, beginning them at a younger age. And typically mom does most of the recording, the studying, the researching and planning and the direction. And she learns a lot like I did with my unit method. 
So an aspect of the unit method that appeals to homeschoolers is, is its ability to cover many subject areas in one study. Well, you know, um, it's funny because you can squeeze math out of just about anything. When Catherine was doing her bird book, they had a collection of bird pellets. They had a collection of eggs and they she measured eggs. She put them on a ruler, line of a ruler to show just how large the eggs were in the pictures, you know, and, and so there was a little bit of math involved, but not much in her, um, she was never into flight. And so she never talked about the, the wing span and how birds fly. She just wasn't into that. She was into their, um, appearance. She loved their appearance the colors, the feathers, um, that's what she was drawn to. She wasn't, you know, she didn't even really care about the sounds. Although to an extent she did because sometimes she could mimic them. Um, but the, the flying part of it just wasn't an interest to her. Now with another child interested in birds, they might be interested in the flight, but you let the project reflect your children. That's the most important thing. Um, if you have a content mindset or traditional subject focus mindset, it will demand so much more of you. It'll demand for you to carefully assure that there is coverage of all the subjects through the unit studies. And that's not what we're about, covering subjects. We're about a process mindset where you're developing the five learning tools. Remember this moms, you're trying to develop learning tools, not provide 12 subjects. Okay. So all of life can be used for the subject content. And if your children can do one project, like some that I've been showing you, they can do anything. They can go on and do anything. It doesn't matter which batch of knowledge is learned before another batch of knowledge. It doesn't matter that Catherine did the bird book first instead of the horse book. She did other books as well. Um, it doesn't matter that she decided to write a few stories about birds before she wrote stories about animals. It doesn't matter that she wrote True Adventures with Nature before she went on to write an essay. What matters is that that was in her to do. One wasn't less important than another, you see? And the subject matter isn't less important than another subject matter. What's important is that she developed her learning tools and, and de fully developed her learning process, the collecting, processing, and communicating of knowledge, you see? So in Catherine's bird book, I didn't have to go get irrelevant curriculum for her project, and I didn't have to go out of my way to create the project for her so that she could learn about birds. <laughs> it wasn't about learning about birds. Although she learned way more about birds doing the project than she knew before she did the project. Because that's what happens through the writing process. You end up learning more than you started with. But the objective isn't about learning content. The objective is to communicate what you know, right? The substance was already there. The knowledge already internalized. Catherine knew her subject well enough to create the project. The book had been growing in her and was now ready to come out. The project was simply the natural next step in her learning process. And I, I couldn't have done that project myself without a tremendous amount of preparatory research because I didn't actually know much about birds at all. You see, as I've written about, uh, as I wrote about my daughter's experiences, I checked with her on any official terminology to you vocabulary I use because just to make sure I was using it correctly. In fact, she actually edited um, this book for me for reporting accuracy. 
Now, I want to contrast unit method with unit of life model because I've been talking about that. And there's a chart here, and it's in the book, uh, the unit of life learning model. And so there's a contrast here um, showing the basic, um, basic bullet points about the unit method the qualities and the qualities of the unit of life approach. And there is a uh, direct contradiction between them. So this is a contrast chart. There's very little that is um, that you can compare. Uh, the unit method is a product mindset. You have this mindset of collecting up knowledge and gaining content and and you want to learn a bunch of content in a short-term process and your goal is to cover all the subjects and and um, it's also often irrelevant information for the student the content is provided by an external source and the product is more reflective of the teacher's scholarship rather than the student and the student remains in a passive role Whereas a unit of life, you have a process mindset. You're going to allow for um, the content to be to grow within the student, and that they will be able to communicate the content on their own. Uh, learning the content is this long-term process, and it encompasses a few years, culminating in a project. And the goal is to develop the learning tools. And the unit content is relevant information to the students, part of their life interest. And the goal, of course, is to develop the learning tools. And it's also the co content is provided by an internal source, the student's knowledge. And the, so the product is reflective of the student's own scholarship. And so the student is actively involved developing their own learning tools. All right. And then next week I'll show you the other charts in the in the other other chapters. We're doing chapters one through two today, and chapters three and four next week. So if you attempt to skip steps in your children's learning process in an effort to achieve a schoolish product, you will succeed in doing nothing but dumping an education on your children and frustrating them. You'll also end up doing most of the work yourself, which may give you a wonderful education or burnout, but they will have learned very little. So now I'm going to go into um, describing the four informal learning activities that are part of this learning model. Reading, which is identification, nonfiction, and reference books. Um, and novels work in there as well, but we're talking about content for life. So if, if it's historical, biographies, or something like that, biographies are always great reading. Uh, you can include that in the area of reading. Uh, the second uh, activity is collecting. The third is reality-based notebook recording, and the fourth is constructing simple related projects. So in order to help our children mature into a vital learning process, we need to not neglect the informal approaches to learning and these uh, less formal avenues in which to pursue learning, such as exploring, observing, collecting, identifying, recording, reading, creating, and building, to name a few, are as valid as the formal approaches. All of these activities can be delightfully and casually pursued during the course of your child's daily routine. And such a plan as this would by necessity include the foundation of child training, rich in governing biblical principles rather than a procedural step-by-step -step program. And most important is a family environment which stimulates and encourages a delight in learning. And as this delight in learning is developed within your child, using informal means, his activities will take on a more thoughtful nature. And this could include compiling and ordering data, simple outlining, recording, research, writing, and journaling. From there, he would move into in-depth research studies. And so the goal of this model is the development and frequent use of the five learning tools of research, reason, relate, record, and rhetoric. 
unless your child is actively involved in a lifestyle process of learning through informal means throughout childhood, there will be little reason to expect him to suddenly embrace a more formal application of learning tools when he becomes age appropriate. You see that? There's a, there's a transition. There's a transition and a preparation for formal learning. And so you can see the importance of utilizing the formative years to equip children with good learning habits through means that they're capable of undertaking themselves, right? You want them to be the students. You want them to be the learners, relating with their own learning process. So, and, and if you, you remember in the book, Science, Art, and Tools of Learning, um, knowledge comes in three forms, principles, facts, or experience and skills and these categories of knowledge are derived from the primary definition of learning learning is the knowledge of principles or facts received by instruction or study acquired knowledge or ideas in any branch of science or literature it's also knowledge acquired by experience experiment or observation and it's skill in anything good or bad and it is these three areas that we pursue the act of collecting of knowledge. To pursue an interest all the way, the student will eventually tap into all three categories of knowledge relative to his field of interest. For example, within the field of music, an interested student will not only learn music theory, but will experience all the dimensions of music at his disposal, such as listening to good music, studying music history, and developing skill in playing an instrument, writing music, or even making instruments. <laughs> my family isn't all that musical, and yet my son decided to, he wanted to learn the harmonica. And he taught himself the harmonica, and he taught himself fluently. He knew how to play uh, wonderful hymns and ballads on the harmonica. For us, I just loved listening to him play the harmonica. And from there, he was 14, and from there he went on to learn how to play the keyboard, the piano. And he never learned the music theory very well. He learned it by ear. He learned theory better later on, but he learned it by ear, and he composed his own music, made um, a CD of his music for me as a gift, and those are listed, the songs that are on this, the pieces that are on this, and that's my piano, my grandmother's piano, that he learned on. And so he went on to do these things, which just amazed me that he could. He also composed and uh, recorded the wedding march for Catherine for her wedding um, that was in the woods. And it was a really long walk that, that she and her dad got to take toward the, the place of the ceremony. And he, he did that work for her. Um, he listened to music, but he never got into um, making an instrument, or I don't think he did. No, I don't think he did. Um, but he did those things, you know, teaching himself those things. I couldn't help him with any of it because I didn't know anything about music myself. So kids who want to learn and know how to learn will figure it out. They will figure out how to learn what they want to learn. Collecting knowledge is the predominant behavioral activity of the learning process that is demonstrated through all these informal learning activities that we've been talking about, the reading, collecting, the projects, and the notebook recording. Collecting knowledge is actually one third of the learning process, um, you know, the three stage learning process. Because it's such a large portion of lifestyle learning, it will need careful attention. Um, it's true that throughout childhood, there's more emphasis on collecting, on the collecting stage of learning. The other two activities of processing, which is thinking, and communicating of knowledge will also be developing to varying degrees. But collecting knowledge is best accomplished by the one doing the learning. The child should be the one gathering and compiling information. 
However, a young child's skill and ability level hinders him from being able to do very much in the area of reading and book research. But there's so many ways to collect knowledge. My son wasn't a avid reader when he was little, but he collected knowledge amazingly in so many ways until he could read fluently. He continued to learn in so many different ways. But instead of prematurely expecting this sort of activity, you can allow your child to collect um, knowledge along the avenues of learning that he's already capable of. Now, John, because he wasn't a strong reader yet, he would read captions in science books under the pictures. He would read that much. He would read captions. If he had a particular section that he really wanted to read, he would get me involved and help so that I could help him read that section. Well, and this is when he was learning how to read. Um, but he just didn't care about reading it cover to cover. Now, I did have him read books cover to cover, but they were very small children's type books um, that he could tackle. He spent most of his time in science-related books. And so every once in a while, he would want me to read a section of the book with him so that he would know what it was saying. Reading captions under photos would generate would focus his interest toward what he wanted to learn in the book the most and that would be what he would focus on reading okay and so there's many ways to collect knowledge without reading he used to dismantle things he loved to take apart mechanical things and that dismantling is how he learned the names of parts and what they did so that he could make new arrangements of parts and create something, invent something for a different use than what the part was originally intended for, which is something that he's done his whole life. He just invents and knows how to fix things. You know, there's my 12 year old knowing how to fix a vacuum cleaner because he made this little robot I let him take apart a vacuum cleaner that didn't work anymore and he made this little robot head out of the vacuum cleaner teeth. And uh, he learned the parts of the vacuum cleaner. And so here, my vacuum, current vacuum cleaner had broken and he says, well, I think I can fix that, mom. And he'd never fixed a vacuum cleaner, but he understood the parts and he took it apart and fixed it. Now, my son actually fixed my vacuum cleaner at least three or four times while he was living at home. He knew how to do it because he had been dismantling parts of electronic and electrical equipment for years. He knew how to do it and continued to know how to do many things. He fixed plumbing issues when he was just a boy. He would fix plumbing issues. He'd fix a drip in, the, in a faucet for me. Um, he fixed broken blinds um window blinds you know different things he would fix for me he replaced doorknobs that were broken um just lots of different things he learned how to do because we let him take things apart well he didn't learn those things by reading a manual or by reading instructions he learned them because he had been dismantling things his whole life and knew what how things were supposed to work. But yes, I still wanted him to read. I still wanted him to read, but he was slow to the reading, um, becoming fluent in reading. So, But I kept reading in front of him so that he wouldn't shy away from it, you see? But I was reasonable in my expectations based on where he was at in that ability. Okay, so there's lots of ways to collect knowledge rather uh, other than just reading or a textbook approach. So if, if your children are allowed avid pursuits in a variety of ways before long, they'll be writing their own textbooks. <laughs> because rather than dulling their learning appetite with textbooks and curriculum programs, their interest is self-generated and they will experience continual growth, producing within them more than a mere smattering of knowledge relative to their topic. My son's talking about writing a book today. Oh my goodness, I'm still a little amazed about that. 
a science related book. Um, so there are simple ways for children to collect knowledge. And the four that I presented here, this four informal learning activities, they're not limited to only a few areas of knowledge. A broad application, every area of knowledge can come into that, uh, can be learned um, through those four activities. Okay, now you don't wanna take one activity like reading or collecting or projects or notebook recording. You don't wanna take one or two and exclude the others because it will stunt the progressive development of your child's thinking skills along with the well-rounded development of all five of the learning tools. You see, these activities um, reflect the expression of all five of the learning tools because with research, reason, relate, record, and rhetoric, okay? With reading, you're taking in knowledge through text. And this is um, conceptual. With collecting, you have something tangible that leads you to do more research. Um, then with the notebook recording, you're needing to document, um, either document your collection or write about it in some way. And collecting, um, helps toward the processing of thinking skills and then the reality-based um, projects. You're constructing simple related projects, something useful based on that interest um, helps with thinking skills as well. And so not to mention just the, um, being related to real life need. So you've got your um, research reason, re record, relate, record, and rhetoric. And so you're communicating through um, your notebook recording and through your projects. There's where you're communicating. And in order to do any of these, you're using the faculty of reason and relate. You're attempting to bring an application to real life. So you see, you need all four of these activities to develop the five learning tools in childhood. And they, they actually complete each other and they're, na they're a natural combination that will automatically produce within your children the content necessary to further master their subjects and develop their learning tools. And so when you have a frequent utilization of all four of these activities, it will continually increase your children's interest in their subject leading toward mastery. When your children know how to do these activities, they will continue to increase in their interest toward their subject and also toward other subjects of interest. So um, instead of trying to figure out how to use the learning tools, what you do is find ways for your children to engage in these activities and the learning tools will develop through doing these activities. Can you see this? You'll begin to see how the learning tools are reflected there in these informal activities. Now, when you think of learning tools, research, reason, relate, record, and rhetoric, they sound formal to our school senses, but they're simply mental functions and communication expressions that are naturally inherent in any learning activity, whether formal or informal. So you can learn to recognize the signs of these functions while your children are busy playing, and you will learn to validate their play, right? That's what I'm hoping. So delving deeper, we would be going into the all four of these learning activities individually. And next week we can go into describing each of these four informal learning activities. And if you make sure your children are engaged in all four of them, it doesn't mean equally, but they should engage in all four of them on a regular basis. Some will be weaker 
they'll be weaker in some more than in others. Like my son John was very strong in projects and weak in reading, but I kept the reading in front of him. So this is wisdom, Mom. You see, I kept the recording in front of him. That doesn't mean that I forced him to do it for six hours a day. I didn't. My children never stayed at the table for more than an hour a day, ever. Um, not until they were older. They were uh, 14 and on up when they really wanted to do bigger projects. They spent a lot of time at the table working on their projects. But uh, while they were learning their skills and learning their reading and writing and doing all of that and their smaller projects, we just did an hour or less a day, including that included math. And so um, then I read to them and, and we had other activities that I had them engaging them, engaging them in. But now, my daughter was strong in the reading and writing, and um, actually, I think she was strong in all four of them, reading, collecting, no book recording, and the project. She was strong in all of it, but her projects um, were more drawing. John created lots of projects from all sorts of material. He used all sorts of materials for his projects, whereas Catherine didn't do that. Her projects were more booklets. She loved to draw and write stories, and so she did quite a bit of that. And she did collect from nature, not just feathers, but other things as well. Um, and so they were different in in a lot of ways, but they were also, they did a lot of similar activities because I wanted to make sure that they were well-rounded in all four of these activities. And they did become very well-rounded, even my son, who didn't do a lot of reading and writing. He became very well-rounded in all of these activities and still is today. And so... You want a well-rounded um, application of these activities in your children's lives because that is what will be developing the learning tools in them. But make sure the content is their content. Make sure it's their interest. Make sure it's something they really want to do, okay? And then make sure that they're doing more than one interest, that they're going into another and then into another and into another. And they will be... Uh, delving deeper in developing their learning tools and they'll be expanding their knowledge base and they'll be doing all the things that you want them to do toward formal education in preparation for a more formal expression of the learning tools you see so it really is not difficult what's difficult is uncovering all of this and explaining it for someone else to use but it's real life and I think what's difficult for you might be because real life I had to take a back seat while you while you pursued serving the artificial for so long you serve the artificial for so long that you think that it's that it's king it's God. It's it's the standard, and it isn't. Reality is the standard. Real life is the standard, and that's what you're wanting to serve. You're wanting to serve something that's related to a real need, real desire, real wants, real needs, a need to know, and the development of your children, their true development, and what they need at any given time. That is what you're really attempting to serve you wanting to steward what God gave you in your children thank you Lord and so I ask you Lord to open eyes here um, give epiphanies Lord to the moms about their children and things that they're having their children do um, show them Lord how to transition from artificial substitutes over to real life giving processes that their children can relate with. Thank you, Lord. 
you know the true relationship true discipleship all of it is a relational process that you want to engage your children in true learning is a relational process you want your children relating with their own learning process in every way it is so rich it's so real and so rich and it's a tremendous blessing to you mom because it is so much easier to do real life that way and real education that way than it is to be um, enforcing uh, artificial substitutes that everyone is pretty much bored with wouldn't you say so I'm going to probably be letting you go now ladies and if you have anything you want to ask me um, before I get off that would be okay too keep reading in front of him mean yeah um, that means um, they don't like it they don't choose to go there but you want to make sure they don't shy away from it permanently and so you keep uh, some form of reading and writing in front of your children on a day-to-day -day basis on the days that you do regular routine now for me that was four days a week Monday through Thursday we did regular routine and so um, on those days I would have a minimal requirement of the things that were hard for them to do okay and I would have them do more of the things that they were good at I wanted them to have learning successes but I didn't want them to shy away from um, ever succeeding in the areas of weakness. I wanted them to overcome their areas of weakness. I've seen where moms would, well, they don't really like to do that. Well, okay, so, well, they don't really want to work with their hands. Well, a lot of that is just lazy. Um, sometimes, well, they don't really want to write. Well, so it's easy to read because all you're doing is consuming but writing requires effort there's a output there well it's not about what your kids want it's about their training you want character formation and you want them overcoming their weak areas and so yeah they're going to lean more heavily toward one activity than another but you want them to be well-rounded because what you're doing is you're saying if you don't you're saying oh well my kids don't need to learn how to reason and they don't need to learn how to relate you're you're actually saying they don't need to learn all the learning tools they only need to learn one or two of them you see so you're wanting to keep the activities in front of them regularly even if it's a minimal amount while you're encouraging them to um, to become more skilled in those areas so it's a little bit I would have John do 15 minutes of reading reading 15 minutes a day of reading whereas Catherine could read for two hours you know um, but a minimal amount of reading not to burn him out and not overwhelm him and disillusion him but to keep the activity in front of him so that he would be able to grow into it and then I applied the one more rule with them I always have them okay this is what I want you to do I want you to write one sentence but you can write as much more as you want as you want to but I won't tell you how much more you can read one verse or two verses of the Bible passage but then you can read as much more as you want so I would have my minimal requirement but then I wanted to stretch them you see this is wisdom moms this is love and wisdom you want to stretch them so you want to keep it in front of them the hard things but stretch them at the same time but you want them to want to do it and so you want that decision to come from their heart how much more so I just called it the one more rule it's like my working out I'm working out resistance training so 
um, the trainer will say, we had this conversation because I, I told her it's called the one more rule because she had the same concept, but she didn't call it that. And, um, she says, well, I'm not going to count these, but you can do as many as you want. And I said, well, I, I'm going to do 20 or I'm going to do 40, but then I'll do more, you know? Uh, I would go to 20, I'll see, oh, I think I can do five more. And then I would choose to do five more. And I says, this is the one more rule. <laughs> because it's in the challenging of, of your children to do more than what is required that's actually coming from their want to. It's coming from a stronger place of want to, of obedience. And so you're wanting that element to be part of their learning process the same with just wanting them to experience successes and so I wanted them to have learning successes in their strong areas of interest eventually to have overcoming successes in their weak areas so that nothing would be left untouched by discipline you see you want to keep a minimal amount of the things that are hard for them in front of them on a regular basis and the main reason for that is so they learn that it's a part of everyday life you want reading and writing and all the hard things to be a part of everyday life so that they grow up knowing that life consists of lifestyle activities consist of reading and writing so you don't just oh well they're done with learning now they don't ever have to write again i know a lot of homeschool kids that don't know how to write because they weren't made to write anything you see it's not a good thing you want writing and reading to be a part of regular life so that they're not they're shying away from it as adults and not wanting to do it and so that's what I mean by that. I hope I explained that good enough for you. Now there's a principle of scaling, yes. That you can scale these activities down for the younger children. Yes, the scalability. And all of the learning tools are scalable. And these projects, these activities are scalable. For a child who loves reading and art and nature, would you be willing to give an idea of what real life projects could be? Um, yeah. Um, projects would be collecting the things from nature and also like for Catherine she made bird feeders um, things like that to feed birds um, um, they made plaster casts of animal tracks um, I don't have that particular one in front of me here so I can't show that to you. Um, I'm trying to remember all the projects they did. Um, they had, um, they kept critters in a cage that Ben built for them. Um, created an ecosystem in each of the compartments for the study of their critters. And then they would release them in the... Actually, you know, I went through all of that in the book, My Journey in Search for the Way, uh, when I was doing that video a while back. It's one of the series that I did, well, part of a series. Um, one of the videos I did, My Journey in Search for the Way, and so I described all of the nature activities my kids were involved in, the projects and different things that they did. and. My daughter did instruction sheets for how to do things related to nature because she wanted to teach her friends how to do them too. And so there was those kinds of projects. Of course, those were written projects and drawing projects because she wanted to draw for everything she did. She had to draw something. And um, my five-year-old grandson, Jack, he... Um, He's collecting mushrooms right now, and he does flowers and um, bugs, and he looks things up 
in the identification books to find, and he gets a little help with that too. He doesn't just read everything yet, but he does get help with that. He has a desire to do it. And um, he wants to know the names of everything. And so that's what he does. Um, he makes things out of paper and cardboard all the time. He'll make flowers and bring them to me. Um, God, he's all, they, he has a whole bunch of um, colors of masking tape. Masking tape comes in all kinds of colors. And he'll make flower petals and stems out of the, the right colors. And they're just really pretty. And so he's always designing and creating um, different things from nature and describing the life cycles. He's very um, rich with vocabulary. And so he'll describe the life cycles of a flower or a mushroom and um, things like that. Um, drawing pictures of what he's doing. Um, mostly he does lots of crafts. He does lots and lots of crafts. And so does Theo. He's six and they do crafts together. And um, they like to fold paper and make it into things. Um, oh my goodness, the other day it was so funny. And I'm not going to remember it now. I don't have that note in front of me, so I better not try. Um because usually I have stories about my grandkids to share. Um, they're always trying new things. So, yes, there's lots of different little things that kids do at that age. It's mostly craft-related, where they can make things from, um, you know, your daughter could make, uh, if she's handy, you know, if she's artistic, then she probably could. If you had some masking tape, she could make a little bouquet of flowers um, out of masking tape. You know, um, Jack makes the petals and puts a flower to, flower bud together. Um, and then the stem attaches a stem that he creates out of green masking tape puts it together. He made a mermaid like that. I couldn't believe it. Look, it was amazing. Um, um, it was all tape, but different colors. And he made a mermaid doll out of um, masking tape. Anyway, because he was really interested in mermaids at the time. <laughs> right now, he's on to mushrooms and the garden is being planted. And so he's out there uh, with mommy doing garden work. And I saw him yesterday with a pot, uh, putting soil in the pot, and and he found some flower bulbs in a corner of the yard, and he transplanted them into the pot. And I saw him doing the whole thing all by himself, and watering it, and then putting it up on the railing outside their um, on their deck, so he can watch it grow. Um, that was just something that he wanted to do on his own. Um, so I don't know if I'm giving you enough ideas here, but with five-year-olds, it's really easy because they love doing crafts. And so projects are just, in my family, projects are, they just are constantly moving on from one project to another. Those boys are. Oh, it's both. Writing is a mechanical skill that they need to learn, and then there's the composition. Yes, and the style, but mostly it's mechanical skill when they're young and then you're teaching them composition, the more they, they get over the mechanics. You don't want them having to focus on too many aspects of the writing process. For instance, you know, in school settings, they tend to have you focusing on the mechanics and the vocabulary uh, and the um, composition the creative writing um, to all together and it, and not to mention the content, having to come up with content. 
that they don't know that much about. And I don't think that's a very good approach. I think that you need to make the mechanics of writing easy where that's all they have to focus on. Give them content to copy so that they can focus on the mechanics alone. When they've become comfortable with mechanics, that's when you start paying attention to the style and other aspects of the writing process, okay? All right. Well, ladies, I'm going to let you go, and I will see you next week, and we will go through these four learning activities that develop the learning tools. And I'll describe them more fully, and I'll ask, answer your questions, give you some more examples as well, okay? Good. Well, Jesus loves you. Remember to love on those precious kiddos today. They're dear to the Lord. Be encouraged for your son. Very good, very good. And, and continue to draw him uh, gently to the reading and writing. I was very gentle with John, so he would not shy away from it. And because if the pressure is too big, um, they will shy away and they'll resist you and you don't want that. And my son never resisted reading and writing with me ever once I knew him well enough to speak to his developmental uh, time frame, timetable. And he was always very grateful and was always very willing to continue advancing his skills in every area and I'm so pleased I couldn't be more pleased with how that all turned out for him thank you Lord so ladies love your precious kiddos let them be who they are and so they're the way they're made is for you mom for you to grow um, grow up in learning um, godly wisdom and patience God loves you, ladies. Bye-bye.